folks, and welcome to the A to Z Sports Big Orange Podcast. I'm Charlie Burris, here as always with my co-host and A to Z Sports writer, Zach Reagan. Wherever you listen throughout the world, we thank you so much for listening to us. Zach and I talk everything balls every week here on the podcast. And if you want to listen to it regularly, make sure you go to the A to Z Sports Podcast Network feed. Podcast Network feed. Apple, Spotify, and subscribe there. Rate, review, subscribe. Give us a little uh, interaction there if you enjoy what you hear. And then YouTube. Go to YouTube.com. Type in A to Z Sports, and we post a video of the show there every week, and you can see our shining, beautiful, midlife crisis faces. Um, <laughs> at Charlie underscore Burris, at Zach TNT, at A to Z Sports on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook.com slash A to Z Sports Nashville, and A to Z Sports.com for everything that we write on the old internet. You know, I love the show so much. I mean, I love doing this show in a general sense. But it is particularly enjoyable when we get to come on and start a show talking about how awesome Tennessee sports are at something in particular. And this week is another one of those episodes. This is, of course, Monday following the sweep of the... West End losers, Vandy. I, I like. I saw somebody call them Black and Gold Northwestern. They were uh, they uh, fell on tough times. Vandy has after so much dominance in baseball and particularly dominating Tennessee. Tennessee hadn't won a series at all over them since 2016, and uh, Tennessee had not won a series in Nashville since 2009. And the balls walk in to. Vandy's dinky little stadium that's actually bigger than Tennessee Stadium, but that will change soon. We walk into their stadium, and we snatch three games from them. Oh, this is good stuff, Zach. Uh, did you get to watch the series this weekend? Yeah, I watched a, a good deal of it. I didn't see a ton of it Saturday because my, my kid had a, a baseball tournament, but I watched a lot of mo- pretty much whole game Friday and then uh, pretty much whole game Sunday. And man, got chippy real fast on on Friday night. I, uh, you know, baseball baseball is kind of my thing. So when Jordan Beck hit that home run in the top of the first against Vanderbilt on on Friday night, and it's like, oh, here we go, you know, offensive explosion once again. And they ask for the bat to be checked. They they call him out. Chaos kind of ensues there. Never. Never really got an explanation that I thought was satisfactory, even from the league office. You know, you, you hear about the inspection sticker that they have, I guess, before uh, midweek matchup, and then they have it again before conference matchups on, on like a Friday where they inspect the bats and they, they put a sticker on it. it. It never really answered the question of was the bat actually illegal or not? Like, I don't know if you've heard that, if the bat itself was legal. So this is what I could discern from the whole – situation they to mark that the bat has been inspected they put a sticker of the series a series sticker on the bat series or game sticker and that bat did not have the sticker of the vandy series on it um don't know I, we have no idea who made whatever mistake happened there well, or i don't know yeah i don't know if you heard this or not that uh the the opponents are responsible for providing the stickers for each team. Like Vanderbilt would provide Tennessee with their sticker. Tennessee yeah. would provide Vanderbilt with, with their sticker. And I thought it was interesting during the uh, in-game interview from Tony Fatello, which has now become legendary because of his references to, to Jordan Beck being a 35-year-old man that forged his transcripts. <laughs> he he kind of – I didn't think anything about it at the time because I didn't know – we didn't know all this information, but – he kind of said something like, yeah, we, we went and looked and we've got several bats that, that would have been a problem. And he kind of said like, you know, kind of kind of funny how that worked out. And I didn't know at the time that Vanderbilt was responsible for providing the sticker. So I wonder if he's like kind of hmm. insinuating that there was some shadiness going on. Maybe maybe some stickers that didn't have the proper adhesive on, on, on them to cause them to. The, so the whole there, thing, I mean, right. Like the whole thing's bizarre. This whole thing. 
Let, let's let's start at I think what is the origin of this? Tennessee leads the nation in home runs by like a margin, a pretty good amount, and and is way ahead in the SEC in general. The offense has been unbelievable on top of the incredible pitching. We'll get to all of that in a second. But I think Corbin sees that, and he goes, these guys are right on my front doorstep. I've had this dominant team for so long. How are they doing this? How does this work? It couldn't be. It couldn't be that Tennessee just has a lot of really talented players on their team, and then Vitello puts them in the lineup, and they hit home runs. No, that can't. That, certainly that could not be it. Also, Tennessee, there's some stuff built into that where Tennessee played a couple of really poor teams and just annihilated them. Iona, Rhode Island, like some of these teams where Tennessee won these games like 29 to zero and stuff. Like they just hit a ton of home runs all in a short span. There's some of that built into it too. But I think Corbin sees this. He doesn't like it. He's in the in-game interview during that game, during that initial game, he kind of alludes to the fact that this had been talked about at the league level and that I guess the SEC is suspecting Tennessee of cheating. I do not know. Um, I, I didn't think that, I mean, the, the offense has been very, very good, but it hasn't been like totally outsized. Scored 26 runs against Ole Miss, scored something similar to that against South Carolina, which is a, a lot, but not like totally outlandish, like holy cow, like Tennessee scored 60 some against Iona, I think. <laughs> it's just crazy, but like, you know, it's it's not... It's not just like on a whole other planet where they're operating offensively. And so I think it starts there. And then, yeah, maybe Corbin is playing some games with the sticker stuff. I I don't know, but that bat doesn't have the correct sticker. Here was the explanation. So, oh, well, let's, let's add this note in there too. So then some Vandy propagandist. Vandy has two media members because nobody cares about Vandy sports. Um, and one of those two, I don't remember the guy's name but he comes out and supposedly says that that bat failed the compression test which means it's loaded it means it you know it hits harder than it is allowed to um and he makes this accusation and vandy fans are there just, we know it they were cheating baby bop, 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 you know and then this news comes out supposedly comes out that the bat's going to be inspected further and the umps are keeping it and this is, uh-oh, what are they going to do? It's Jordan back has to be suspended. Like, Vandy fans were having a field day with this. And then John Wilkerson yesterday, who is, he works for the team. He is on the Vol Network um, and calls every single baseball game. He's the, if you do not know, I think most people know, but he's the radio guy who calls all of Tennessee's baseball games on the radio. This is what he said about the situation. By the way, the Vols will get Beck's bat back after today's game, uh, this being the Sunday game. Uh, quote, the notion that there would be further examination, etc., is incorrect. Since the bat did not have the series sticker, it was taken out of play. The umpires have had it in their dressing room since then. It's back in play on Tuesday. So he kind of squashed all of those rumors. Um, someone in the comments said, do you know this is fact? Many have said it's to be inspected further, whatever that means. Wilkerson replied, and he said, yes, much has been said, but the only issue was the missing sticker. The bat passed inspection on Thursday. So I think Vandy fans made up a story in their head that they were about to catch Tennessee uh, cheating, and instead they just got their bell rung in three straight games. <laughs> and, um, I don't... I, Obviously, who knows? It does not appear that this was a loaded bat, that they're, that Tennessee is playing games like this. That would be horrific. Just truly, I hope that that is not the case. That would be terrible and really, really disappointing. But I do not think that's the case. It doesn't appear to be the case. Um, and apparently, this same exact thing happened to Auburn last week. Um, I said I'd never seen that happen, but apparently it happened to Auburn last week also. So... Who knows? Uh, it, but Wilkerson, I will say I trust Wilkerson implicitly. Um, a good guy, and I don't think that he's going to put that out to try to mislead anybody. And I certainly trust him over some Vandy fan who writes about Vandy on the internet to an audience of three. I don't know who reads that. Um, and so 
there's that's everything that I could surmise from the situation. I don't know if you heard anything else. Yeah, I mean that that's pretty much what I'd heard as well. And it still it still doesn't make sense to me how you can like I understand the rule is the sticker has to be on there, but that seems like such a flimsy thing, like literally and figuratively, of where that sticker can fall off at any point. Like it these bats are getting tossed around. You're getting hit. I mean, I don't know exactly what kind of sticker it is or what it's supposed, to, how it's supposed to, where it's supposed to be on the bat. If it's kind of on the handle, more on the barrel, I don't know. But that I mean that seems like something that could easily happen. So if the bat passed the pregame inspection, to me that that should override anything. Like there should be some sort of different system in place. Like okay, these are the approved bats. You can't have anything else in the dugout type situation. Everybody agrees to that before the. The series starts. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing they're trying to do that to prevent you from bringing in a different bat on a Saturday since they don't do the inspections every game. But even then, you know, you're moving stickers around. I don't know. It, it doesn't seem like a very good system. And then on top of that, what are the chances that Vanderbilt knows that sticker fell off uh, in the first inning after the first home run and they go straight to that bat? Like, doesn't so that seem off? The, the video, there was some investigation after this on Tennessee fans' part. And the video is interesting. Beck hits this home run. He drops the bat. And nearly immediately, Vandy's catcher, as if he was directed to do so, and I bet he was, picks up the bat and looks at it and sees that this sticker is not there, supposedly. We got to make sure that it wasn't whatever and then he hands it to the ump i really didn't like the ump like taking the bat mm -hmm. away and holding it away from vitello what are you doing that's ridiculous yeah. um so i mean that was a clown show all the way around mm -hmm. but i goes goes back to my original point about corbin vandy's coach i think he told his players if these guys hit a home run grab the bat look at it make sure that it's right because we think they're cheating and I think that's exactly what happened. It's the simplest explanation. Where there's smoke, there's fire. He's going out here and publicly saying that we're suspecting it at the league level. There had been talk about this before the game and these stuff like that. I think that's exactly what happened. I think he told his players, these boys are cheating and we need to go and find out how. And then they took away the cheating bat or whatever they did. And Tennessee still beat their head in. So I'm sorry that you know you couldn't win even then. But because uh, even Beck ended up having the most offense in that game, even still, they took the bat away and he hit a beautiful double that scored multiple runs later in the game. <laughs> so, yeah, tough, tough look for Vandy. Corbin's a goon. Um, I honestly, I, I was I don't want to say I was disappointed. I'm, I'm never going to cheer for Vandy at all. But I would say that I was in the past. I've respected Corbin in a sort of Nick Saban kind of way. The th what he's built to Vandy has been really impressive, and the way that he's kept it up for as long as he has um, has been impressive. But if you're going to do this type of stuff where clearly you're insecure over the fact that your closest rival is is really, really good, um, I think it's nonsense, and I think the guy is a loser, and I think that he – step off. Like, wh who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? The arrogance well, of this guy the, is absurd. Yeah, I, I, I agree, and <laughs> I think we both said as much in our uh... – our group text uh, on Friday evening. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, Corbin, yeah, <laughs> Corbin kind of misplayed his hand. If you think about it, like, okay, take out and just, just pretend it's two random teams playing, take out like any, any uh, subjectivity uh, to this, the game. And if you're Corbin and you kind of know that this is a possibility and rather the sticker thing is they knew about it or, or didn't know about it, they were just taking a chance once, once they did that one time, Tennessee's going to check all their bats. Like, it's not going to be an issue the rest of the game. He did it on a solo home run in the first inning where there was two outs. It wasn't a – like, going down one nothing in the first inning is not a big deal in any baseball game, you know, unless you're just facing a, a Cy Young caliber pitcher. It's not a big issue. You typically – you don't see a lot of one nothing games. You, you should have saved it later on for like a – what is it, a three, three run home run the next inning? Was that the what happened yep. or two mm -hmm. runs? Yeah, like save it for that. Like that. That's when you should have been okay. Going down four nothing's a lot different than, than being down one nothing. You didn't really all. You, all he did was wipe one one run off the board for Tennessee, and then 
kind of fired up Tennessee's baseball team. I mean, they was a completely different yep. team after that. They were ready to go, and mm-hmm. it, it was done. And it obviously the proof is all there. Lipsis hits that home run, and I believe the very next inning or or the inning following that. Uh, and comes around the bases. He chirps <laughs> at the ump. He chirped at the ump, and then obviously chirps at Vandy's baseball players. And then he picks up his own bat and he does a mock, like checking the bat after he hits that home run. I mean, you, what are you doing? You went at a team that is at this point known far and wide in the college baseball world to be this kind of over the top, got tons of bravado. They're they're pumping their chest. They're known for that, and you go and give them the best fuel possible. I mean, it, what more could you have done to fire this team up? And they just went out and kicked their butt. The offense worked. The offense was not as much of a steamroller as as it has no. been in, in recent weeks. And v- credit Vandy's pitcher, especially that kid on the second day on that Saturday game, was really good. The, they, they put out, I think he... It said he was the number one right-handed pitcher in, in the last class. He was a freshman, and he was the number one right-handed pitcher out of that class. He was slinging it, and Tennessee still managed to put up the runs that they did. And then Tennessee's pitching. I, I, I hope I, I think there's a big chunk of Tennessee fans, and kind of until Vitello showed up, I would say I was really in this camp. Until things got good, I was in the same camp. There's a whole section of Tennessee fans that aren't really huge baseball fans in a general sense. I'm, I was just much more of a passive Tennessee baseball fan. It's a fun thing to go do on a Friday afternoon more than I was watching every game. Vitello obviously has changed that. Uh, there's a ton of ton of fans like that, but I, I hope that people realize what is happening on the mound for Tennessee right now is otherworldly. They have three guys to start in these weekend series, three in a row, who are all pitching at a borderline MLB level. And... Teams like don't know what to do. The Chase Burns was incredible. Drew Beam threw a complete nine inning game with two hits and was pitching 97 in the ninth inning after pitching a hundred, you know, throwing a hundred pitches. He's still hitting 97 and, and working the ball beautifully. This is I, <laughs> I you don't you don't say that it's like lucky or anything like that, but this is special. This team is special. I it, It's hard to overstate that, man. It, this is crazy. It's crazy what's happening with Tennessee baseball right now. Yeah, all the talk about Tennessee playing in a small ballpark or a hitter-friendly ballpark, a, a lot of that was erased after the Ole Miss series, right? I mean, they went out there and scored 27 runs in Oxford. But another thing that erases it, like you're talking about, is the pitching. They have the best team ERA in the NCAA right now, 1.80. The next closest team is UCLA at 2.5. I mean, that's a pretty significant gap. Uh, Tennessee's given up 50 earned runs, 61 runs total, and 250 innings. I mean, that is insane. I mean, that's they're giving up an average of two runs a game, less than one earned or less than two earned runs a game. I mean, that right there is as bit of a reason for their success as, as the offense. Really, probably more of a reason because without good pitching, I mean, that's really what carries teams. I mean, at, at every single level, it's all about your pitching. And they're, I mean, it, it is unbelievable. Uh, we knew they were good last year, but just the step forward they've taken this year and a lot, I mean, it's talent. They obviously have talent, but with any baseball team, it's all about the culture. It's all about the locker room, the clubhouse. There's so much idle time. There's so much time for players to get tight, put pressure on themselves. And it's such a mental game with, with baseball that I think Vitello is really, I mean, he deserves so much credit for what's happened because he's created this atmosphere. Of just He's letting these guys be themselves. They've become public enemy number one, which I know is something you love and have talked about Tennessee fans should embrace being – being the enemy and this baseball team is really everything everything you want the football team to be is what this baseball team is right now <laughs> yes if only football could get this good I, I was saying this to i was watching the the saturday night game with some friends of mine um tennessee is playing baseball the way that alabama football plays football mm-hmm. just annihilating on on defense and then Incredible on offense. I mean, it's just, it's both sides. You're hitting them from both sides and you're beating, you're not just beating teams, you're steamrolling teams and you're steamrolling good teams. And 
it's it's unbelievable. I I think this obviously it has to carry all the way through June. That's the key. You're not winning any yeah. trophies by sweeping teams in April. But I I would put it this way. A lot of teams worse than this one have won college world series national championships. A lot. This team is better than the Mississippi state team that won the national championship last year. Significantly, I would say. Um, so just take that of what it is. Baseball is a funny game. Mm -hmm. And, and a lot of the time the best team quote unquote can, can lose. Um, just because of the nature of baseball. But if you got specifically the pitching, if you have the pitching that Tennessee has right now, like think about this. These guys are this good. First of all, all three of them are coming back. The None of them meet the criteria to leave after this year. Two of them are true freshmen. Um, and then Blade Tidwell, he does meet the criteria to leave after this year. He'll be old enough, but he hasn't played all season. He's played a single inning. And he. everybody thought he was going to be the ace. The guy that they thought was going to be the ace has played one inning all year. And then this weekend, you have arguably the best reliever in baseball and Ben Joyce, the volunteer fireman. God bless him. He didn't play this weekend. He didn't play a single inning. He, he's played one inning in the last two series, and you swept two of the best teams in college baseball. Like, this is a team that is playing in another stratosphere. And it's, and it's not small park home runs, and it's not an outsized offense. It is a completely well-rounded, well-coached, well-constructed, beautifully put-together baseball team that is playing at the top of its ability. And you just, this is, to, to say that this is like a blessing for Tennessee sports right now is a total understatement. Like, you can't, I, as I said, you, you're playing like Alabama football right now. You have to keep it going. And baseball is all about avoiding slumps and working through slumps and making, you know, making the adjustments you have to make. And that's all on Vitello. We'll see how he handles it for the rest of the year. But as of right now, this is a national championship team playing excellent baseball. And I'm, I'm beside myself. I just, just I'm, I'm like giddy to watch these dudes play baseball every single time. It's, it's appointment television. Don't let this slip by if you're not watching. Don't be an idiot. <laughs> Watch this team play. It's unbelievable. It's truly unbelievable. I, I cannot stress that enough, man. You're talking about avoiding the slump in baseball. I think based on kind of some of Tony Vitello's comments after sweeping Vanderbilt, it almost seems like, not like it's at the front of his mind, but it's almost like a slight concern. Like, are we too good right now? Yeah. To yeah. where adversity will hit. Like, uh, Former Cincinnati Reds outfielder Jay Bruce once said, you know, there's two types of players in baseball. Those are the, those that, that have been humbled and those that will be humbled. Like baseball always kind of comes around. It will always humble you in, in some way. So how does Tennessee deal with that when it inevitably happens, when they do suffer a tough, you know, 10 to 3 loss in a conference game? Like it's going to happen. It's just the nature of baseball. As many games as they play, it's bound to happen. Just have an off day. How does the team rebound after that? I think Vitello kind of he doesn't he doesn't want to lose a game. Of course, he wants to win every game, but he wants to see how this team responds to adversity. And I don't know. Like right now, it's it's is there going to be adversity? <laughs> is a is a reasonable question to ask, even though you expect it. They're just playing so well; it's hard to see it happening, but. Because I mean, here's here's the thing: if you specifically with the pitching, if you hit adversity, you with one of these guys, let's say one of them just starts having some off games that can consecutively, you have Blade Tidwell waiting yeah. right there. Seth Halverson hasn't played yet either, right there. Now it's, I, we're not sure about his timeline yet, but Blade Tidwell is ready to go. They're working him back in. As I said, he's he's played one inning so far this season, and it was this past week. And there, so. You know, one of these guys slumps soon. You have the guy you thought was going to be your ace waiting in the wings. <laughs> and when in the one inning that he played, he he started off kind of rough, and then he came back with two straight strikeouts. Uh, and so he's yeah a little rusty, but he's going to come right back, and he's going to be that guy again. And this this team is just built to win. I like that's it. This team's built to win, and this team just delivers. Also, they're built to win, and they carry out on their abilities. Um, and, and I think in terms of slumping, I mean, the way that Vitello handles this team, I think is so beautiful because he keeps them loose. You said it there. 
an incredibly cerebral game, baseball. You get in your head, but Vitello, just the way that he carries himself, he's just never he he gets hot when he needs to get hot, but he's an incredibly calm, even keeled guy. And and he lets these dudes be who they want to be. He keeps it loose and just lets them operate. And I I just I think this is this is it, man. I, I don't know. I I think this might be the best chance that Tennessee sports has had to win a national championship in a major sport in a very long time. Since I, I think I would go the way that they're playing right now, I would go back to the the Candace Parker teams with Pat Pat Summit, Candace Parker, the Lady Ball teams in 07, 08, where they I mean they were absolutely dominant, won two national championships in a row. I would say this is the Tennessee sports team in almost any sport that I've seen that is close to dominating the sport that they play in the way that those teams did. I, I think that's the closest comparison that I can make. So again, don't let this slip by you, man. This there, this team is cooking and it's crazy. And I, I don't want to hype it up too much and then have it, have it backfire, but you've got to talk about what's happening. You have to talk about how unbelievable this team is. They're about to, if they, if they, uh, win two games against Missouri. If they win the first two games against Missouri, they will have the best start to an SEC baseball season ever. They'll be 11 and 0 in SEC play. It will be the best start ever if they win two more games in a row. <laughs> like that's how good this team is. Like you just, I, how, how else are we supposed to talk about it, Zach? You want to be cautious, but how else are we supposed to talk about it? Yeah. It's that good. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. Yeah. It's, it's to the point where if they, win the first two games against Missouri, set the record, and then lose Sunday, it will almost feel like a disappointment, which is, is something that should be cheered like crazy. Just winning a series in college baseball is a big deal. Uh, but now, after sweeping Ole Miss and Vanderbilt in back-to-back weekends, it almost feels like it would be a letdown to, to lose a game to Missouri, which is also an interesting matchup anyway because it's, it's Tony Vitello's alma mater. Mm-hmm. So you're, you're going, you, you got that kind of storyline going on there. And th- this is a little bit separate from, from the game itself, but, and you mentioned it, I think touched on a little bit earlier. Vitello was every chance he gets, he kind of talks about stadium renovations and there, there's money coming towards Lindsey Nelson stadium to improve it. But he mentioned after beating Vanderbilt specifically he said, Hey, these, these baseball stadiums are, are too small. He was talking about the ticket price, for the Vanderbilt Tennessee series, which was outrageous. I mean, they're talking about more than some final four tickets just to get in. And he's talking about Tennessee stadium, Vanderbilt stadium. They're all too small. Like you need, you need bigger sec stadiums. And it's true. Like you, you see these sec baseball games and it's a different crowd than uh, ACC baseball game or, or, or other conferences. I mean, it is really like a football wild like, atmosphere in the spring. Yeah. It, it's unbelievable. Uh, and hopefully we will see some good things happen at Lindsey Nelson Stadiums, some nice improvements coming down the line. I, I hope so. Vitello has earned it and more. Um, That's really like all he wants. <laughs> I mean, he's truly he, he but I think absolutely rightfully so, though, because mm-hmm. Tennessee arguably has just some of the worst facilities in SEC baseball. SEC baseball is incredible. You look at at. Alex Box Stadium for for LSU. You look at Duty Noble down in Starkville. Like these stadiums are awesome, <laughs> and Tennessee's baseball stadium is not. Even they they added seating during this off season, and it's just like bleachers down the left field line. Mm-hmm. There there needs to be a real investment in this because the dude's the best coach on campus right now. I don't think he's even close. Who who else would it be? Because he's he's putting the best product on on the field, the court, whatever it may be, out of anybody at that school right now. Um, and I, man, it's absolutely crazy, but what a, what a turn of events as Bob Kessling, the great Bob Kessling would say, what a turn of events this has been. We thought this team might be good. We thought this team might be good, but they are, as I said, operating on another planet, like in another atmosphere at this point, it's really exciting. But I, before we move on, Zach, any, Anything else about baseball or what happened over the weekend? It's kind of been quiet in a lot of other places, although we do have more to talk about. But anything else with with baseball? It's just really fun to see 
you know, Tennessee dominating Kentucky in basketball, their main sport, and then dominating Vanderbilt in baseball, their main sport. I mean, there's and you're, you're already dominating both those teams in football. I know Kentucky and Vanderbilt both, both stole a few wins from Tennessee in the last decade, but it, Tennessee still has the upper hand. Uh, it's got to be tough to be a Vanderbilt or a Kentucky fan at this point. Van, Vandy baseball, Vandy fans, because really the only Vandy fans there are are Vandy baseball fans. I mean, who's cheering for Vandy? football who is cheering for vandy basketball <laughs> their fans were like so beside themselves mm -hmm. after this series ended i had some trying to talk about oh well good game but your offense was average okay, i was like what are you talking got about swept <laughs> doesn't but swept and, and swept and dominated five zero <laughs> that last game six what's five zero six two like these games were close and like you said, close. Vanderbilt has one of the best pitching staffs in America as well. I mean, they yeah. are third in team ERA. They're almost a whole run below Tennessee, but they're exactly. right there. I mean, th it's not like we were facing some some puff team. Like, <laughs> this is Tennessee dominated one of the better teams in all college baseball. And they were just, I, I had a guy, the the only response that he could come up with when I was kind of talking my, talking my ish on Twitter this weekend, the only response you could come up with was, wasn't your basketball team supposed to be playing this weekend? I was like, the basketball team? This is the best you got. This is the best that you could come up with. Like, you, these people call Vanderbilt the Harvard of the South, and this is the best that you could come up with? You couldn't go, like, academics? Yeah, you got us in academics, and that will never change, really. Yeah. Uh, but that's, at least go to that. Basketball? We beat you 10 straight times and won the SEC tournament this year. <laughs> basketball? So they're they're in a sad state of affairs. It even <laughs> one of my best best friends in the entire world is a Vanderbilt fan. Um, and I think he's actually like mad at me <laughs> after this. If we haven't spoken, I I would put it that way. He's a close. Did, did close you friend. talk? Did you talk any trash over the weekend? Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Okay. <laughs> 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 can't leave that part out <laughs> well well i'll have to i'll have to reapproach after things have cooled down a little bit not you know monday might be a little too soon um but they're i mean i can't blame them i would be i would be in a tough spot too if we had this sport that it was the one sport that they've been able to hold over tennessee for all of this time and i give it up to them you could corbin put together some excellent baseball teams and has been a, a great coach for them even though they Arguably, they have a little advantage with scholarships. That's a whole other conversation. But anyway, um, they they did a great job, and we just snatched it away from him. And not only – it's not like it was – a, you know, Tennessee has an average team this year, and we had a miracle sweep of Vandy. We're the number one team in America. We killed them. We wiped the floor with them. And that's – yeah, I think that's what makes it worse for, for Vanderbilt because – you could kind of compare it to uh, like 2012, 2013 when Vanderbilt beat Tennessee back to back years in football. You know, something that just, I don't know if it had ever happened before, at least not anywhere close to our lifetimes or, you know. But, but even then, like Tennessee football was down. I mean, you had the Derek Dooley getting fired year 2012, Butch Jones first year where the team had no depth in 2013. This Vanderbilt, this Vanderbilt baseball team is good. I mean, they're what? Or they're ranked third at the, at the time? Uh, ninth, I think. Or ninth. They, they, okay. Top ten. Top ten. Top ten yeah. team. Like a really a good, solid Vanderbilt team. I know they lost some of their key pitchers from last year, Lighter and Rocker. But, I mean, this this is a good team that, that Tennessee beat. It's not like the old Vanderbilt's down and, you you know, you won't this won't happen again type deal. That I think that's what makes it even worse for Vanderbilt fans. Yeah. Because it's it's really the equivalent of if Tennessee football started out seven and zero and like dominated Florida and dominated uh, you know Georgia, Georgia and South Carolina and then went to Alabama and beat Alabama by twenty like that's the equivalent of what just happened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't I don't know if I don't know if this Vandy baseball team is as good as like a typical Nick Saban Alabama team, but I would say that's a closer comparison than Vandy beating Tennessee in football a few years back. Like, it's yeah. a way closer comparison. Um, so, again, just to make this – I want to put this in in the context so we can get – I want to get as many people on board as possible um, with this baseball team because, man, this is – what a joy. 
it just is it's so fun to to tune mm-hmm. in go to the games please i well it's tough to i think like all the games are sold out at this point um it's tennessee's been setting attendance records at basically every game that they have <laughs> so which is i mean that is insane for early season college baseball to be selling out like this at tennessee mm-hmm. i mean that that really right there tells the whole story of everything that's happened this season. Yeah. It's just give these people a winner. That's I, what I say about every Tennessee sport. We're so hungry for a winner. Just give us that. And we will be right there. So hardcore behind you at every game, at every turn. <laughs> just give us a winner, man. That's all, all we ask for. Uh, so that's that with baseball could talk about it all day. Cause it just gets me so hyped up, but uh, there has been other things that have happened in Tennessee sports, even though this one is actually going to go back before our last show, but I think it's relevant uh, to still talk about as the next topic, spring practice still ongoing with Tennessee. And, and I would say, thankfully really not much has happened. We kind of discussed it last week sort of looking at what the defense is doing and trying to get any morsel from that that you can, and there just hasn't been much. Looking at at the offense, at a guy like Taven Jackson and kind of seeing where where he's at and where that might be. Uh, but otherwise, just not not a ton to draw out of this, this last week of, of spring practice. And there's really not going to be, because it's not even the complete team that's there, and guys are injured, and they take it kind of easy sometimes during spring practices. So... Um, that has been the case for the last week. Heupel and some coaches talked and there wasn't, it just wasn't that much notable to say, but last week, Josh Heupel did do an interview with Trey Wallace of, of outkick.com, Clay Travis's website. Um, and had it, an interesting thing to say that I kind of want to cover here with you, Zach. Uh, and I'll, I'll just play it. This is basically Josh Heupel addressing the sort of quote-unquote rumors, even though we really kind of know it to be fact at this point, of Tennessee sanctioning itself through this NCAA investigation. Like kind of getting out in front of the NCAA investigation and saying, we'll slap ourselves on the wrist, then you don't have to do it, NCAA. And uh, and Trey asked Josh Heupel about this situation, and, and I'll just I'll just play the clip and let it, and then we can talk about it right after. Going. Uh, this will be an interesting it, one in a long process. How did you navigate the ongoing investigation into the program that you weren't involved in and that, but you were having to pay the price for in a sense? Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, but I mean that in a way of how did you navigate the decisions to like be like, okay, you know what? We're going to go ahead and we're going to take the punch on the chin right now where we don't have to take that punch on the chin you know, two years from now, because yeah. there's a lot of different, and I know you can't go into them all and you're not going to, but there's a lot of different, you know, recruiting restrictions or how many players you have on your roster that goes into these type of decisions. How did y'all sit down and like, all right, we're going to navigate through this, but we're going to do it right now. We're not waiting. Yeah. You know, for me, uh, our administration and, you know, from our president to our chancellor to, to our athletic director, we have a real communication and, and line of, of communication with them um, it allowed me to you know as leader of this program to, to kind of see where we're at uh, where we think it's going to be uh, I said from the very beginning I thought it was a, a small speed bump uh, for this program um, because of that trust with them uh, been able to, to navigate those waters uh, really pretty efficiently I think you know we were able to, to put ourselves in, in some unique positions that um, you know, I think are going to pay dividends for this program moving forward. Uh, things that we were able to, to kind of swallow up in, in year one. And, and uh, you know, we're kind of off and running and, and full steam ahead at this point. So you have to parse it. But because Hypo puts all of this in coach speak. <laughs> but some of the things that he says there, we said we put ourselves in some unique positions to take care of some of this stuff in the first year. Um, and he said, you know, he, he thought it would be a small speed bump and do kind of have to decipher it. But he's essentially confirming that Tennessee has done these things. Uh, does not go into any detail, and he shouldn't, um, but has done to some extent 
potentially roster restrictions. Trey said it there in the video, roster restrictions and, uh, you know, other <laughs> things potentially uh, down this road. And Hypel more or less can confirmed it there in the way that he said that. But um, I found this interesting because what I want to know now is when is it over and what does it mean going forward? Because this, you look at the recruiting that Tennessee could do now, especially with Nico in the fold. Where does this go from here? How, what, what can we do? And so what, when you hear that, Zach, what were some of your thoughts? Well, I mean, I think the first thought goes to the the scholarship reductions, whatever that ended up being. But another aspect of this that I think has really impacted Tennessee and, and may have impacted why they didn't have a higher rated uh, class in 2022 is, and we've heard a little bit about this bits and pieces, is it, it seems like Tennessee put some restrictions on themselves as far as on-campus recruiting, maybe off-campus. Uh, you know, I, I know there were weekends in the fall where they didn't host any recruits, which is huge. I mean, that is, that is when you uh, – these recruits have such busy schedules. It's not – you can't just say, hey, come up for the Georgia game. and They, they might have a seven-on-seven -seven tournament. They might have a, a actual game, a camp, a visit to another school – family stuff i mean there's so many factors that go into when these visits can happen and, and they don't always happen so if if you miss a weekend where hey we could have got this guy on campus that might blow your whole shot with the kid because very few players are going to commit to a school site unseen uh, i think cedric tillman's one of the only ones in recent memory that can come to mind there might have been others but that that really has an impact on recruiting so if all that's behind them we're kind of seeing recruiting with Nico and stuff tick up a bit. They're in the mix for some four- and five-star players that they weren't in the mix for before. I think that's almost as important as the scholarship reductions. It is. It's it's huge. And it, it sounds like this was probably discussed during the hiring process. Uh, yeah. And goes to the point that is becoming increasingly clear in my mind that hiring Danny white was huge. And I think an incredibly smart step for whoever made that executive decision. If it was plowman, if it was Boyd, if it was both of them together, if it was somebody on you know the board, I don't know who thought this up to go big or go home with the AD hire, but I think they've been, incredibly smart with that hire. And then now with the way that they've set this up, essentially selling it to a guy who they thought could have success. And it looks like he, he just might, but being able to sell it to him as we have a plan here is what we will do to navigate this and go forward from there. And I am impressed and shocked <laughs> Obviously, we have to see how it plays out. We have to make sure that the NCAA doesn't come down hard in the future. And you never know with these idiots. The NCAA loves to, you know, catch North Carolina red-handed giving fake classes and do nothing. And then they give uh, Donnie Tyndall a 10-year show cause for, like, do illegal tutoring or whatever he did in his whole thing. So who knows exactly how that's going to turn out. And it is definitely contingent on whatever the NCAA decides to do in this case. But they were proactive. They were on top of this. They had a plan in place and they are executing it. And now you ideally, I assume we, we don't know the full details, but you got to assume he, the, again, the way that he says it, you kind of have to parse it. Do we get this out of the way up front or however he said that we get it out of the way in year one, however he might have said that there. Assume that it's more or less over now. And moving forward, you did we I mean, have we like cleared the cloud now? That's that's the question. And we're not really going to get an answer. But the real question is, if you have that's so massive. I mean, it's a huge, a huge thing. In all credit to everybody involved, if it does ultimately turn out to be the case. I mean, the NCAA is unpredictable, but the Tennessee works so closely with the NCAA that you have to wonder if maybe there there was a little heads up. 
I know it's backfired on programs before. We've talked about it before, but at the same time, surely that would count for something. Kind of doing all this stuff on your own, helping with the investigation, basically doing the investigation for the NCAA. I mean, they didn't. They just kind of set in on everything while mm -hmm. Tennessee's internal investigation revealed whatever needed to be revealed. I mean, you have to trust the NCAA on this, even though that's not usually wise. I mean, we saw they finally kind of came down on LSU after many, many years of of wondering what was going to happen there, and it finally cost Will Wade his job. I don't think – I mean, LSU didn't really – they didn't cooperate at all. I mean, Will Will Wade straight up ignored text and wouldn't, wouldn't give them any information. I mean, he just said, screw it, which I respect in a way even though Will Wade's a terrible person and, and I'm, yeah, okay. Recruiter, I get pretty good recruiter, but anyway, I, I think cooperating with the NCAA is going to help them is going to put this behind them, but you don't know for sure. Like it's always kind of going to be hanging there. I don't think it's going to be as big of a weapon on the recruiting trail for other programs to use against Tennessee. But I think in the back of Josh Heupel's mind and the back of Danny White's mind, they know it's not 100% settled. So there is that kind of uneasiness about, well, what if the NCAA kind of goes rogue and decides to to really hit us with a severe penalty? Yeah, that, that's the that's the only factor in this is just how the NCAA Be, is. Because to... Tennessee did not impose a bowl ban. Like That's the one thing they did not yep. do. And I wonder if that is – because LSU actually did. It was kind of – smart on their part i guess but they did they it weren't gonna 20... make one no well i mean in 2020 i guess everybody kind of made one if you wanted no, to true. go yeah but yeah they they were they probably weren't going to uh, under normal circumstances and it was kind of a strange year anyway lots of bowl games got can i mean tennessee's got canceled they didn't even get to go which Kind of would have been embarrassing at three and seven anyway, but <laughs> but I do wonder if that like factors in that that Tennessee did not do that. If the NCAA will view that as something that needs to happen, or does Tennessee go like the twenty twenty season was that punishment? You know, was kind of like we we set out that bowl that year, you know, and because that we was, got was, invited, got invited to one. You know, you can't say we didn't. Was three years and, of Jeremy Pruitt not punishment? <laughs> Exactly. And they fired absolutely everybody. Tennessee has been comprehensive with this. Mm -hmm. Very comprehensive with this. In in a way that I don't think I ever saw Tennessee ever doing. Because I've... I will say... Well, they made all, players sit out, too, when they found out. I mean, yeah, Eric Gray and several of those yeah. players that set out there. I think it was the Texas A&M game or mm -hmm. one of those games, yeah. And, and so... I'll say if this ends up turning out and the, the NCAA lays off, nothing ever really comes of it. They're they're able now to recruit at a much higher level and more seriously, clearly with this, as I already mentioned, the commitment of Nico and now the the sort of gears that that gets moving for you. If if this all turns out well, I am more than ready to eat crow in this situation because. Yeah. I am certainly a person. I hate the NCAA. There, as far as like being a, a person who was in media for years, the the NCAA is the bane of my existence. I hate everything that they are and everything that they stand for. I think they're a sham organization. It's a corrupt cartel run by idiots that should be shut down. It should be illegal, frankly, uh, what they do. With that said, <laughs> in this case, I have always been a never, ever, ever, ever cooperate with the NCAA kind of guy. And in this case, so to speak, through cooperation, Tennessee has kind of beaten the NCAA at its own game and potentially totally won out in this situation. I will happily eat crow. I, I will say you, you could have just avoided this on the front end by just paying Pruitt to go away, and you wouldn't have ever had this uh, you know, potential lawsuit hanging over your head and crap like this. Although we we don't really know, they may not have even been able to do that because the NCAA stuff might have been out of the bag already by the time they're ready to fire him. I, there's a lot behind the scenes there that we're not totally sure about. But that 
that would have been my preferred outcome. Just pay this idiot to go away. And then he's away. And then that would have just been clean, easy, wipe your hands of him and say bye. Um, but if you were going to do this, and maybe Tennessee was truly backed into a corner and had to do something, wh- well done. It, again, assuming that this turns out well, well done. Yeah. I, I think it's it, this was a, a master stroke as far as but the, if it's Hypel, White, whoever schemed this into existence, I as of now, I'm very impressed and I think things are looking up in that in that way right now. On the flip side of the positivity, I think there's one scenario where the NCAA does decide to come down hard on Tennessee harder than maybe we expected. We know right now the NCAA is pushing back against some of this NIL stuff. Uh, They don't want schools involved. They're very, they want to readdress some of the rules. And we also have Nico with a very publicized. Good point. Yeah. Possible eight million dollar deal. We don't know. We don't have confirmation that it's Nico, but all the signs point to it being Nico. Um, it, it it seems that's the case. Does the NCAA look at that and be like, you know what? There's not much we can do about that because it's going through this collective. We don't have proof that Tennessee is directly paying him or or telling somebody to pay him, but we can still penalize you for this other stuff if we want to. Like, is there kind of like a reaction to the Nico deal with this other stuff? Like, that's a that's a little yeah. bit of a concern. That's interesting, uh, because again, there's a lot of assumptions going into this conversation. But <laughs> yes, it's assuming that that eight million dollar deal is real. We we really fleshed it out on last week's show. Go listen to it if you if you want to. Um, but assuming that that is all real, that's an excellent point that hadn't really crossed my mind that the NCAA might take an affront to this because you can tell the NCAA is scared right now. They know the con the end game of this. They know that Greg Sankey and the SEC at large is out to end the NCAA. I think Greg Sankey has made that infinitely clear. He hates <laughs> the NCAA and the fact that they have sway over what the SEC does. The SEC is getting to be so powerful that he I think he just sees them as an obstacle to what the SEC could be. Um, and I think the, the NCAA is seeing all of that and they're panicking as they should be. Again, I think they're an illegal cartel that be that should be shut down, but they should be panicking right now. The end game of this NIL stuff is that they are no more, that they're uh, eliminated and it expedites that process. It was already happening. We were going down that road, but it really speeds things up. And so maybe they do lash out. That's again, they're, they're the rogue element in all of this that, that made me go. You should have just paid Pruitt to go away. If you had that option again, we're not sure if they did, but if you had that option, you should have just paid this guy to go away and not had to worry about this because you may do all of this stuff and still get slapped. But again, assuming they don't get slapped, I think it's a masterstroke. And I, I think they have it's incredible, and, and Danny White should be applauded for it. But time will tell. Uh, and I, it, I just thought it was worth addressing. It's a very, honestly, it's a fascinating situation, I think. Yeah, unfortunately, we won't know for sure, probably for several years, because that's years. the way the NCAA operates. But... The good news, as you've mentioned, is that for now it appears that Tennessee is moving forward under normal operations, and if something happens, they'll deal with it then. But for now, they're they're able to recruit at a kind of all everybody all hands on deck approach. So I, I think yeah. said as long as it turns out okay, this Tennessee recruiting stuff it, it's moving in the right direction now. I mean mm-hmm. you're. You're really on the cusp of a top 10 class, maybe even a top five class, depending on what kind of magic Nico can work. You get like two or three of those in a row, and you're right back in the SEC conversation. Like we saw it with Butch Jones. He got a couple of, I think he only had one top five class. He had a top 10 class in there. Within two years, 2015 season, all of a sudden there's enough talent where Tennessee's beating Georgia. They, should have beat Florida that year. They, they, you know, they should have done a lot of stuff in 2015 and 2016. They had 
college football playoff caliber teams both of those years, I mean, Hypo can get there really fast, like in the next year or two, if they keep at this pace. It'll take some serious time to get competitive talent-wise with an Alabama or a Georgia, but you can get right back to being basically number three in the SEC two years. I mean, I, I think you you can turn around that much pretty quickly. I mean, um, you're already thinking that they're probably the second best team in the East right now? Yeah, I, I, that has to be the assumption, right? I mean, you beat Kentucky this last year already, and they would kind of be right there. Florida has like this you, new coach you're not sure about. And, you have to beat Florida, but you know Tennessee was the better team. I mean, Florida beat Tennessee last year, but Tennessee was the better overall team team yeah. from results standpoint uh offensive standpoint all that so i think you're still you still have to prove you can beat florida but if you're just looking at everything on paper like tennessee is definitely the better team and and i'll i'll say this they should and i think they will like you said operate as normal from here on out you've done you did your time you did the crime you did the time they operate as normal from here on out, really try to minimize the impact of any of this NCAA stuff with recruits. Get Don't let your opponents kind of have that talking point. I think to a certain extent they've eliminated that because it's not like your opponent knows what the NCAA is going to do either. So you go forward and assuming that this takes three, four years, within three or four years, Tennessee could win the SEC East and be right right back there. And if they slap you after that, I, I mean, honestly, the NCAA, hopefully the NCAA is dead by then. I don't know. <laughs> that would be the best case scenario. They probably won't be. Uh, almost definitely won't be, I would say. But, um, you know, if you, if you are already winning and in that mode and then you get slapped, it's going to hurt way less because you're – you know, you're in a good position. Maybe you could take the hit of some scholarship reductions, a, a bull ban. I mean, I don't think it, it's so hard to project at all what the NCAA would do, but the most hurtful thing would be scholarship reductions. But if you're already good by that point, whenever that might come down the pike, so be it. Just operate as normal from here on out. Be get the best recruiting class that you can, put together the best team that you can, win as many games as you can, and then we'll deal with it when it comes. Just kind of put it on that back burner and go when it when it happens, it happens, and we're gonna operate as if it's not happening until then. I, I think that's the correct move going forward. I mean, I, I've even said in the past, I would love to cheat with impunity, cheat with it, no shame, and win a national championship and then have the program kind of burn down, <laughs> but you won a national championship. I don't care. Win a national championship. It's kind of like with the Titans right now. They kind of have this team that's built uh, where they are they could be Super Bowl level if they just put the, a couple of puzzle pieces together. And they're like, oh, well, you'd have to mortgage the future for a quarterback. I don't care. I want to win a Super Bowl. Mortgage the future. Because you know what will happen when I have that tough season the next year? <laughs> I'll wipe my tears with a Super Bowl trophy. Dummies, I want it now. So go win it, and and let's – hopefully what I'm saying doesn't ever happen, but I'm of that mentality where I go, let's win now, and if you get punished later, deal with it when it comes. You cross that bridge whenever it presents itself. And, and I I don't know. I, I hope that that is what is about to happen with, with Hypo and this football team because if, if so, I think it's really exciting for the future. I think they are going to recruit at a high level. I mean, I think that's kind of clear. You got arguably the best quarterback in this upcoming class already in the fold. So that's that's just exciting me, man. I I, I love it, and I hope that everything that we're saying here is is right and kind of comes to fruition. Yeah, I mean, it, it's certainly on the right path. We'll see if it if it continues. I feel good about it for the first time in a long time. Uh, I'm with you. Do whatever you have to do to win. Nobody cares about vacated championships. Nobody pays any attention to vacated yeah. wins. Doesn't matter. You just happen to notice it on a Wikipedia page when you go to look up a, a coach's record that that some wins were vacated. Then you got to figure out what actually happened and what what counts and what doesn't count. You know, you can't erase the parades, the celebrations, and all that. But 
it doesn't sound like Tennessee's going down that road anyway. I mean, they're trying to do things the right way. And luckily now with the NIL stuff, you can reach into your pockets and 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 pay a player to come play for you. And Tennessee seems pretty much very okay with that. And thank goodness, because otherwise they wouldn't stand a chance in the SEC. Yeah. Nobody I, would. I mean, you, 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 every program has to do it. Alabama, Georgia, they all have to. I hope it works out how we're thinking. So there, there you go. Just another positive note, another good thing <laughs> to say about Tennessee sports. And we'll continue to assess spring ball as if anything comes up. Hopefully, honestly, hopefully it doesn't. Um, I, I like a good quiet spring where you don't really have to have too many conversations about things happening. I mean, some I don't I don't know what could happen positively, really. But the thing that always gets talked about in any springtime is negative. Player gets injured, something, you know. Something happens down that road. Don't give us anything like that to talk about. Just good, good vibes, good positivity. Let's put it out there, speak that into existence, and uh, hopefully we'll we'll just keep on this track. I mean, what is this? What how what are we doing? Tennessee sports are good, Zach. Why? How is this possible? This doesn't happen. Yeah, it feels like uncharted territory for. For me, and I'm sure you as well, for, you know, you saw this growing up, but over the past, well, pretty much our adulthood, it just has not been the case in most yeah. sports. So I really don't know how to, I keep waiting. I just keep waiting on something bad to happen. Like I'm bracing myself. I just expect it. <laughs> I feel like it's It'll easier happen. that it, it's easier that way. That's how I watch sporting events. I try to kind of mitigate the, the emotional damage by preparing myself for it early on. Sometimes even before the game starts, I just assume the team I'm pulling for is going to lose. That way I can't be hurt when it happens. Exactly. That's the, the perfect mentality. Hope for the best, expect the worst. Uh, that's the Tennessee way. Hopefully the worst does not happen with any of this. Uh, I think that might be a show, Zach. Mm -hmm. Any Anything else for the good folks at home that you might have might have had that you want to drop in here at the end? No, nah, it feels like it pretty much about covers it. Uh, we'll see if Tennessee baseball can keep it rolling against Missouri this weekend. They play Lipscomb midweek game. Uh, hopefully they they don't lay down for that one. You got to keep the keep the positive momentum going. Yes, don't don't let Lipscomb catch you. It, it does. We already kind of said it. it. Something will happen during the season. It's essentially unavoidable. You play too many games, so don't. Even if it does happen, we're not going to get derailed. It's a very, very good baseball team. So, with all of that said, I am Charlie Burris. That is Zach Reagan. Thank you so much to everybody who listens. You guys make this possible. Uh, you're amazing. Um, the YouTube, A to Z Sports on YouTube, A to Z Sports.com, A to Z Sports Podcast Network feed, rate, review, subscribe. I don't know. You, can, I mean, you guys listen to this. I say it at the beginning of the show. Why do I need to say it at the end? Everybody have a good week. Go balls. Good vibes. And we'll talk to y'all next week. See you guys later. Your mother, she can't buy you.